Good evening, saints, and I want to greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for our message this evening as we exit our Sabbath space. We're going to read from the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 14, 1, 4, Matthew chapter 14, and we are going to be reading from verse 22 of Matthew chapter 14, going all the way to verse 33. That is Matthew Matthew chapter 14, 1, 4, we are going to read from verse 22 all the way to verse um, 33. That is where we will pack it at verse 33 of Matthew chapter 14. And this is how the message goes. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat to go before him to the other side while he was sending the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was strong and against it. Now in the fourth hour of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to read your word once again. And it is always our prayer that when we have read your word, we may be transformed. This is our prayer through Jesus. Amen. Okay. The portion that we are looking into of Matthew chapter 14 From verse 22, it begins earlier in the day when Jesus had been preaching to multitudes to the point that the Bible tells us that he was now surrounded by thousands of people who were hungry because they had been listening to him and Jesus concerned about them going home hungry, he then asked the disciples to prepare food for this multitude. They then answered and said, we cannot provide food for everyone here. We just don't have enough budget. But what we do have, we have here only five loaves and two fish. Then the Bible tells us 
that Jesus then made the people to sit down on what was a very a, a, a grass-like a patch on the mountainside. They sat there, they ate. And as the people were eating, it came to their minds that Jesus has just fed them with five loaves of bread and two fish. Then the people realized that with Jesus as a king, the whole nation will never be hungry ever again. If this man can feed 5,000 people, and as he feeds them, by the way, the Bible says the 5,000 were the men only. This excluded the women and the children, including that young boy whose lunch was taken. He is not counted in the 5,000, but he also ate with everyone else. Now, the Bible gives us an understanding that people really thought about this. That if this guy, on average, feeds 7,000 people or 8,000 people, with five loaves of bread and two fish. He fed them with the six items. So we can already uh, suggest um, that from the seven items rather, there is a ratio here of one item is to a thousand people or so. So the people realized that if you give this man 100 loaves of bread, then he will feed 100,000 people. Why not make him the king? No one will ever be hungry ever again in Israel. There will be no homeless people. There will be no poor people. There will be no rich and poor. Everyone will be equal because the same king will feed everyone. And so the Bible, the Bible says the people started to discuss with each other, is it not wise to crown him as king? Is it not better if we just decide to crown him as king over all of us? And of course the people agreed, but not only did the people agree, the disciples also loved this. You see, the disciples, as much as they lived with Jesus, who Jesus is and what he stood for, honestly made the sense to them after the resurrection. Before the resurrection, they were very much confused about who Jesus is. They believed in him, they loved him, they followed him. However, there was no full understanding of what his kingdom really was about. Only after the resurrection did they seem to understand and everything he had ever taught them and every sermon he had preached only made sense afterwards. So, the people and the disciples agreed, let us force him to be our king. The first part I want to address this evening, as we go into the new week, know that in life you may be surrounded by people who love you and mean well, but they do not understand your vision and where you are going in life. And so sometimes those people may be excited by opportunities that you seem to be not interested in. Because when you understand where you are going, not everything that comes your way actually excites you. You know where you are going. 
you know what you want to achieve. And so some opportunities that come your way are simply there to test your focus on what you believe you want. Now surrounded by people who may not understand where you are going and what really burns in your heart, they may with a good intention want to push you to a particular direction, not knowing that that is not who you are. The disciples were excited to hear the people say, we want to make Jesus our king. And the disciples went to Jesus excited to say, Master, Master, look, they want to make you king. And Jesus, realizing that his disciples truly don't understand what he came to do, he put them in a boat, asked them to cross to the other side, and he also dismissed the people to go home. I need us to respect what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is not saying his disciples are bad people. He simply understands that they have not yet grown to understand what his mission, his brand, his vision is about. So I'm saying to you and I as we start this new week, know that you may come across an opportunity to be a king and those around you may think it is the opportunity of a lifetime. But what makes an opportunity yours or not is not that it has arrived. The question is, is this what God sent me to do? Jesus now had an opportunity to be a king. The people loved him. Why did he reject this opportunity? Because while being a king was nice, it was not the vision he came for. So I do want us to learn from what the Holy Spirit is teaching. If God has given you a vision of what he wants to do through you, there may be good opportunities that may come your way. It does not mean take them. They may not be in line with the vision God has given you. The second part of this that I want to share. The people did not think that Jesus would make a good king while Jesus was talking. After he fed them, they thought he would make a good king. That's the second point I want to make. Nothing speaks of politics better than a stomach. You see, when a stomach is full, people will praise whoever has filled their stomach. And when their stomachs are empty, you could give them words of life, it doesn't matter. When the stomach is empty, people don't see anything. When their stomachs were full, they thought through the stomach. They realized this guy could feed them for many years to come. So their stomachs were thinking about the future. That you know what? It is so nice to be full from this man. If we make him a king, we will be full for many, many, many years to come. That's the second part I want to raise to you. Be careful of advice that you are given by people whose stomachs you fill. It may not be based on the truest assessment of what you need to do, but they may be responding in a manner that will not compromise their stomachs. So please, when looking for advice of what to do, try and avoid asking people who are your dependents.
dense. Because obviously, whatever you tell them, all they are thinking about is, are we still going to eat after she does this or he does this? So it's very important that when looking for advice, speak to people who will not benefit from what you are trying to do because then their stomachs have no interest in what you want to do. These guys were simply using stomach politics to decide the future of Jesus because he had filled their stomachs. Third lesson I want to share this evening. As Jesus dismissed them to go, he never said to the disciples, you are weak, you are pathetic, you are disappointing. He simply just said to them, look, get on the boat, go on the other side, I will meet you on the other side. That's the third lesson I want to share with you today. We live in such a toxic world where people are convinced that if someone does not understand you, they are your enemy or that you need to cut them off. That is absolute nonsense. It's not biblical. People may misunderstand you. It doesn't mean they hate you. It doesn't mean they are toxic. Jesus simply told the disciples, cross over. That's it. He knew that they misunderstand him, but they meant well. They were still his disciples, even though they had made a mistake. Today, people act like they are some kind of a brand. Everyone in social media is all about cut off people with bad energy around you, you know, toxic people. I don't, I think it started with Oprah some years ago, this whole idea of bad energy people. That's nonsense. Some people just don't understand you. It doesn't mean they are evil. It doesn't mean they should be cut off. You must just learn to manage them. Not cut them off. Manage them. Jesus knew how to manage his disciples. He didn't cut them off. He just asked them to cross over. And I find it so painful the way social media has influenced people to be little gods. Like everyone must fit into you. Everyone must have their energy in tune with your energy. Everyone must speak your language. They must be in your brand. They must be in your level. All this nonsense of being a false god. And it deprives you the joy of working with people, enjoying different ideas, and getting to interact with diversity. You will not grow seeking people who only speak your language. Here are the languages. Here are some criticism. Here are some people who misunderstand you. At least that tells you you are beginning to learn how you may be coming across from other people. I preach sermons. If you've noticed, I never give a title to any of my sermons. Precisely because I believe the best title for a sermon must come from you based on what the sermon has done for you. So if I ask many people, what did you gain from the sermon I preached? I am always blessed as I hear tens of different ways, hundreds of different understandings. Some of them 
were not even in my thoughts as I was preparing and preaching. But I'm amazed at what people were gaining. That's the point. The world cannot be filled just by people who speak your language, who release your energy. There is a whole lot that we can gain from how other people do things out there. I'm not saying if people are negative and they put you down, don't make a decision. No, I'm saying don't fall into the trap of being a demigod and act like everyone was born to meet your energy. This is life. Learn from wherever you can learn. Some people love you. Though they may make mistakes in understanding you, but they love you. Just because they misunderstood, it doesn't mean they are not part of your team. Very important. Jesus managed his disciples. Didn't cut them off. He just said, guys, cross over. I'll see you on the other side. They left, he dismissed the crowds, he climbed the mountain to pray. While Jesus was praying, the Bible tells us that somewhere around the fourth watch, which is somewhere around 3 a.m. or so, Jesus now is coming down from the mountain. Now look at this. He last saw his disciples yesterday at sunset. So somewhere around 7, 7.30 p.m. And he has been on the mountain the whole night praying while they were caught in a storm the whole night. Then Jesus came down. And when he saw them in the middle of the sea, Jesus walked on water, walking towards them. Was he going there to catch up with them? Absolutely not. The book of John chapter 6 tells us he knew where they were going. They were going to Capernaum. So if Jesus wanted to go there, he could have walked there without going to them because he knew the destination. Jesus went to them because they were in trouble. He walked on water because they were in trouble. The next lesson I want to share with you, please understand that when God comes for you and for me, his intention is never to entertain. His intention is always to save. God has always been about saving, not entertaining, but saving. When God crossed the gap between humanity and God, just like now, Jesus was going to move from land and walk on water. It is the same when the immortal God chose to cross over and become human. The point was not to catch up with us. The point was to save us. When God comes for you, he is in the business of saving, not to entertain. And I think sometimes we forget that. Sometimes when Christians come to church and we preach sermons about salvation, they say things like, the sermon is boring, the sermon was, was, was not exciting. Dear friends, when you want excitement, you buy a PlayStation. When you want to be saved, you go to God. Very important to understand that the church was not established to entertain. 
the church was established to save. So even if the church will entertain you, the end result must be salvation. That is the whole point why God has closed the gap between him and us. As Jesus was approaching, they cried, it's a ghost. They had never seen anyone walk on water. And so this was just a terrifying experience. Jesus says, take courage, it is I. Another challenge to this verse. I who? Why not say, take courage, it is me, Jesus. Take courage, it is I. I who? This statement, it is I. This is one of those which we call the I am statements of Jesus. All of them are rooted in Exodus 3 verse 14 where God says to Moses, you shall tell them that I am has sent you. You shall tell them that I am that I am. When Jesus would use the I am statements, he was emphasizing that I am the same God who delivered Israel out of Egypt. Now I am here to deliver you. The challenge is, why not say it is me, Jesus? Take courage, it is I. How were they expected to know who is I? Very simple. Jesus says, I know my sheep, and my sheep know my voice. He didn't need to say it is Jesus. When he spoke, immediately they identified the voice that it is not Jesus, their Lord. This is why, listen to Peter. Peter then said, Lord, if it is you, notice how Peter puts an identity to the eye. Because Peter identifies the voice. Do you know the voice of Jesus in your life? Can you separate between the thoughts inspired by God and your own delusions of grandeur? Do you know the voice of God? The voice of God is not a mysterious thing. The voice of God is not something that a mama or papa or prophet or apostle or pastor is going to teach you. The voice of God comes only by your own direct commitment to read the word of God. The more you read the Bible, the more you get to know how God thinks and reveals himself. So that when he speaks to you, you know this is consistent with the God I have been reading about. Otherwise, every mama and papa and whoever is out there will tell you that God has spoken to them about you and you will believe because you don't have your own relationship with God. Peter and the disciples had spent enough time with Jesus to hear his voice. They may not know all his abilities like they didn't know he could walk on water. But that's the thing. When you know God's voice, you don't have to know everything he can do. When he does it, because you know his voice, you will identify.
identify him. What am I saying to you? When he walked on water, he performed a miracle outside their expectations. Allow God to surprise you. Allow God to work outside the box. Allow God to touch your life in ways you couldn't imagine. But how will you know it's him, the voice? Whatever miracle God performs in your life, you don't have to predict it. Of course, we are not God. We can never predict how God will answer our prayers. But how can I tell if my prayer was answered by God or by someone else? Very simple. Study the voice. If it's the voice of God, it will be consistent with the voice in scripture. Then you will know, I am surprised by the method. But the voice tells me the identity of my blesser. And so, they cried it's a ghost because the method they didn't know. But when they heard the voice, they knew the identity. I'm still saying, no one can ever predict all the ways God may answer our prayers. He is God. His ways are beyond our thinking. However, in the Bible, he has given us his identity. We may not know how he will answer, but we can test the answer through the character of the God revealed in Scripture. Then Peter says, If it is you, Lord, ask me to come and walk on water. That's the next lesson. If God wants to act outside of the box in order to save you, then understand that you have every right through him to also live your life outside the box. Jesus came walking on water. What did Peter do? He decided to leave the conventional mode of transport called the boat. And he thought, let me walk on water like my savior. Nothing wrong with that. When you are in Christ, you have a right to achieve things that other people will call witchcraft. It's okay. If your God is abnormal, you are allowed to be abnormal. As long as you know your source is Jesus, let them say you have a snake. Let them say you visit people at midnight. As long as you know you don't do this. And that the reason you live an abundant life is because you walk where your Savior has walked. What am I saying to you? Jesus and Peter here are teaching us that what is abnormal to human beings can become normal between you and God. You and God. You and God can make the abnormal normal while other people think it's abnormal, you and God make it normal. Learn, as I have seen on social media these days, they like this term, this term, normalize. Well, let's use it. Normalize making abnormal things normal between you and God. Normalize greatness. Normalize excellence. Normalize working outside the box between you and God. Learn to move a bit higher in the way you assess life. Leave the boat. Walk on water. Jesus is willing. 
Take a risk with Jesus. By the way, a risk with Jesus is no longer a risk. It's a normal decision. Because in him is all the security and the protection. Peter walked. Peter walked on water. He did something no human being has ever done before or after. We exclude Jesus. He was the God-man. Peter became the first of our kind to walk on water. And I need us to understand, we can turn the impossible possible if we step where Jesus has stepped. Don't forget, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. The abnormal will always be abnormal if Jesus is not there. What makes the abnormal normal is that you and Jesus are keeping a connection. When, John, when Peter lost the connection, he began to sink. But good news, when you travel with Jesus, even the rescue plan is with you. Jesus pulled him up. The last point I want to make for today's message. When Peter was sinking, Jesus did not say, Listen, man, demonstrate some faith. If you just show faith, I will save you. No. Jesus saved him and only commented about the faith after. And listen to what Jesus says. He doesn't even say, Oh, Peter, great is your faith. That is why I saved you. He says, Oh, ye. In other words, Peter, you did not have enough faith to please me. Yet I saved you anyway. Why? Because we need to understand the grace of God. Faith is a gift from God that you will grow over time. But when God saves, he doesn't save us because we have enough faith. He saves us because he is a gracious God. God will always save you even when your faith is not enough. And only after he will then teach you how to have enough faith. And so as we begin a new week, don't be afraid to walk on water. When we come to the end of COVID-19, we will need to open Noah's Ark. The difference between Peter and Noah is that Noah needed to wait till the water disappeared so that he can walk on land. Peter, on the other hand, realized as long as Jesus is on the water, I don't need to wait for the boat to reach the land. Two people with faith in God, but they responded to water differently. The other one stayed in the ark till the waters disappeared and the land appeared. The other one realized with Jesus on the water, I can walk on water as well. May I suggest this to you? As we have gone through this period of COVID-19, many things that used to be normal will end. Life will become very different after this pandemic. Careers, economies, relationships, churches, religion, it will all have changed. If you love the safety and the security of a boat, 
you will remain here. But those who are willing to venture into new territory, don't be afraid to walk on water. Because when COVID-19 comes to an end, history will be looking for water walkers. People who are not afraid to start a new thing altogether. Go there. Even when they tell you it is water, you will sink. If Jesus is standing on it, go there. It is the time for a new world to be born. New churches, new businesses, new careers, new spirit, new ways of doing things. Don't be afraid. Walk on water. It is the season for abnormal things to be made normal in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, help us. Help us to walk with you on the waters of life, knowing that you are there and that your grace is sufficient. Teach us to rely on your grace because our faith may never be enough. The waves do not fear our faith, but the waves fear you. So help us to rely on your grace more than in our understanding and give us the courage to follow the great I am wherever you lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.